The sun sets early in Siberia. At dusk, Bayer in Chinov, one of the most celebrated and experienced shamans east of Lake Baikal, begins his shamanic rituals. Today's ritual is designed to invoke the spirit's healing abilities and thank them for their powers. At one point during the ritual, a spirit penetrating Bayer's body is expected to help the shaman deal with people's issues as well as heal them. When a shaman becomes aware of the onset of the state of trance, he puts on a cap that covers his eyes. The cap protects the shaman from evil spirits and safeguards the onlookers. According to popular belief, ordinary people are not supposed to see the shaman's eyes at such moments because this might cause them harm. Then the shaman's crown comes into play. This headgear is fashioned out of iron and has horns on top. Shamans say that as soon as the invoked spirit makes its appearance in the form of a cloud, the horns help guide the spirit into the shaman's body. As the drumbeat quickens, the nervous tension of the people gathered in the yurt quickly begins to peak. Then the drum abruptly falls silent. The shaman falls to the floor and begins spinning on it. This means that the spirit has entered his body. Video cameras are switched off. Filming a shaman in this state poses a threat to him and his audience. Work at the Russian Academy of Sciences is drawing to a close. Valentina Haritonova, head of the unit for the study of shamanism, is inspecting the new exhibits displayed at the Institute's Ethnographic Museum. They have been supplied by scientists returning from this year's field expeditions. Valentina has spent years studying humans' extrasensory and extrasensitive potential. Shamanic rituals differ depending on the ethnicity of the shamans. Each ethnic group has its own interpretation of the spirits. In this particular case, the spirit penetrates a shaman's body in a somewhat unusual way. To all appearances, the shaman's mind undergoes a change which is the result of deep immersion. He narrows his soul, as it were, and sublimates his energizing powers. The soul leaves the body at some point to make room for the spirit. It is as though the spirit occupies the shaman's body while his soul leaves it. Shamans are a rare and unusual sight in Chelyabinsk, a major industrial city in the Urals. Even so, a shaman by the name of Tsyurgen Kam has managed to balance shamanism with life in the big city. He is the latest representative of a clan of shamans spanning seven generations. For centuries, Siberians have become shamans when called upon by the spirits. Apart from his spiritual activities, Tsyurgen Kam practices music. In the morning, he goes to his small studio in central Chelyabinsk when not performing his duties as a shaman. At the entrance to the small backyard, there is an oba, a sanctuary for the spirits who are regarded as the local masters. Tsyurgen prays to them and offers them gifts. Shamans highly value their support. Tamir is a friend of Chirgen. He is a soloist at the local opera house. It took the two men a great deal of effort and time before they found a unique musical niche. Since then, they have been creating a new trend in club house music, folk instruments in combination with throat singing against an electronic background. The musicians feel it is now too late to develop a taste for folklore in young people. Consequently, they are trying to pave the way for them to traditional music through modern sounds. When you find yourself in a trance during a ritual, you suffer spiritually, so to speak. Music helps me withdraw from that state. I can't set shamanism and music apart. I can't focus only on music or shamanism alone. I distance myself from music each time I perform a ritual and vice versa. The resulting symbiosis helps me live life to the full, rather than eke out an existence. The morin hur is their instrument of choice. In the Mongolian language, morin means horse, while hur means violin. 
Quite often, this instrument is referred to simply as the horse's fiddle. Each violin bears a horse's head, symbolizing that the instrument is a living creature. The strings are traditionally made of horsetail. Two strings symbolize yin and yang, manhood and womanhood. For that reason, one of them is made of the hair of a stallion. The hair of a mare is used to make the other. The two strings produce a unique harmony. Legend has it that once upon a time there was an invincible epic hero who had a winged horse. When he fell asleep, enemies chopped off his horse's wings. The wingless horse died. The hero commemorated him by using his hair, skin and bones to make the first Morin Hur. As soon as he started playing the instrument, he recognized the voice of his dear horse. As they strum their songs on a Morin Hur, Mongols, Buryats and Turvinians dedicate them to their beloved steeds. Throat singing begins here, in the diaphragm. Each time I try to produce the sound, I strain my belly to send it upwards. I make my vocal cords vibrate a little. The result is something like a roar. I believe that shamans were the first to practice throat singing. It's because this sort of sound wards off evil spirits, which are trying to take control of sick people. Bayer in Chinov regularly hosts his patients in his little house situated close to the shaman's yurt. Many of them live hundreds of kilometers away. What's wrong? There isn't much health in me anymore. And in general, there is something wrong with my life. What's your name? Svetlana. When were you born? 1963. Have you had headaches? Yes. When did you first feel them? Not long ago, as far as I can tell. When were your x-rays lost? Last spring. Please give me any number between 0 and 12. 6. 4th and 5th vertebrae. Your body is cold energy is blocked by the neck bone. Your kidneys and other urogenital organs are not in the best shape either. But to begin with, you need to have your neck bone fixed. You'll need an X-ray photograph of it together with a description. I've brought some vodka I kept at home, like you told me to do. Okay, I'll have a look. Where was your mother born? Somewhere in the Kuban region. Were there any priests among your forefathers in the maternal line? They were Cossacks convicts. I think they were churchgoers anyway. Would you say that men in the maternal line die early? Yes, they die earlier than women do. Your great-grandmother lost an icon protecting your clan's males. Discuss the matter with the priest. I suggest you have the icon restored and consecrated. It will help you in your life. Of course, we weren't born at the right time to believe in all that. But I am telling you that if you keep the icon in your household, your son might father four boys and two girls. Bayer in Chinov finishes consulting his patients late at night. His followers, meanwhile, get ready for a ritual to lift the curse that has weighed heavily on the men of a Buryat clan for many years. The ritual's principal target is a 17-year-old boy, the youngest of the clan's males. According to the shamans, the spirits imposed the curse in Mongolia when one of the boy's ancestors broke a holy birch tree many years ago. Birch trees cut down beforehand have been put in the ground near the shaman's yurt as a sign of people's request for forgiveness. For several hours, these people will perform sophisticated rituals by festooning the trees with ribbons and sacred objects, wetted in milk and fumigated with fragrant juniper smoke. Take off your cap, go down on your knees to the sound of the drum beat. Turn around clockwise. Run around the trees and stand behind them.
Run around the trees three times. Now circle the cup three times. Down on your knees here. Pick up the grass from the ground, put it in the cup and drink it. People dig up the birch trees and again pray to the spirits, asking them to accept their gifts as an atonement for a tree desecrated a long time ago. The procession then heads to the sacrificial bonfires in the steppe. All the so-called white food, like bread, cakes, cookies, butter and cheese, is tossed into the fire. Milk and vodka, too, are considered offerings to the spirits. The flames of another bonfire lick birch trees decorated with multicolored ribbons. All this has to be reduced to ashes if the spirits are to meet the people's requests. The shamans need to have extraordinary skill. They need to display a super-sensitive reaction and enormous powers to influence people. The big question is how they do it. Scientists may have to rack their brains over the problem for a long time to come. The most difficult part of it is explaining it in scientific terms. As an ethnologist and psychologist, I can say that most of these things have a psychotherapeutic effect. In this sense, any shaman is an excellent psychologist and psychotherapist. Being a traditional shaman in a city is a difficult task. Sometimes Chögen Kam jokingly refers to himself as a degraded shaman because he can't afford to drop out of the fast tempo of modern-day civilization. But whenever the opportunity presents itself, he heads for the holy glade he set up in the forest. Before entering the forest, the shaman pauses before a birch tree which is supposed to protect his glade from intruders. You can't just walk past this place. You should give the spirits a hadak. It's a blue scarf that takes your wishes and prayers to the sky. Shamanism is not an entirely native religion in Chelyabinsk. That's why I made a point of looking for such places. When I was performing a ritual, the spirits told me to come here. This birch tree has four trunks sharing one root. This is the holiest and most revered place. As for the birch tree, it belongs to a higher world. Although the shamanic ritual continues well into the night, Bayer in Chinov gets up early in the morning, as always. He wants to make sure he has a good supply of firewood before the onset of winter. Winters in the Aginsk steppe can be bitterly cold. I first started seeing my ancestors when I was still a child about the same age as my grandson is now. I began studying shamanism around 1988. My first guru was Tibugmit, a woman who lived here in the Ginsk district. She subjected me to eight old-style rituals, which no one else practiced at the time. After she died, I went to Mongolia, where I found another guru. It was some time later that spirits began entering me. The fact is that each generation of my ancestors included talented shamans, even all the way back to the twelfth generation of paternal relatives. And so the spirits began entering me to see whether I had a mark identifying me as a shaman. Bayer in Chinov is a successful farmer as well as a shaman. He has spent a lifetime working on a farm. When he could afford to buy a plot of land, he did so without hesitation. It is a place where several generations of maternal relatives have been buried. There he built a shaman's yurt and started a farm. Shamanism and farming together is not an easy task, and Bayer has to work hard. He can't remember when he last had a day of rest, but he considers himself a happy man. Despite the rigors, he now has more than 150 sheep and goats. Bayer is even playing with the idea of buying a felt-making machine. Bayer's farm was ravaged several years ago by fire, but even that never stopped him from abandoning the land of his ancestors. Building a new house took him a lot of effort. He set up a serge, a traditional Buryat tethering post near his house. It indicates that this land has an owner.
A grand gathering of Bayer's followers is scheduled for noon. Yevgeny Belakrylov lives near the border with China and has covered 300 kilometers in order to see his guru. I revealed some talent when I was still a child, but I thought everybody could do what I could. When I was 33 years of age, something began tormenting me. I decided to give vent to my gift. I turned to people I knew, priests and lamas. The lamas made some calculations and told me that my ancestors were Buryat shamans. They also suggested I find a guru for myself. At that time, I didn't have an idea who shamans were. I had only seen some in films. I had serious doubts about my future when I came here. After all, I was a 33-year-old Christian Russian. But I thought I must respond to the call of my ancestors for the sake of the children and their future. Now it was my turn to do the work. Today, shamans get together to discuss current issues, share plans for the coming week, and find out details about the journey they are going to make soon. Once the meeting is over, they will set out on a journey to a mountain that shamans regard as a holy place. A ritual will be performed there. As always, Bayer in Chinov is happy to see his followers. All of them have taken different paths before they face their guru. Black shamans communicate with the spirits there to the right of Bayer. Their main tool is the tambourine. White shamans establish contact with the gods. They are to the left of Bayer. Their hands rest on ritual canes with bells. Bayer in Chinov was the first to begin reviving shamanism beyond Lake Baikal after a long period of oblivion. During the first Russian Congress for the study of shamanism, Bayer met with Michael Harner, the legendary American anthropologist and organizer of the Foundation for Shamanic Studies. Harner was so impressed by Bayer's talent that later his foundation awarded the Siberian shaman the title of living treasure of shamanism. Now that the gathering is over, the shamans are about to set out on a pilgrimage to Mount Sakhanai. They will cover at least 100 kilometers through lowlands, mountain passes, and heavy going forest paths. None of Bayer Rinchinov's followers has been here before. This is one of the most private places that give the guru his shamanic powers. It has been considered one of the sacraments of Buryat shamanism for a very long time. A tall cliff bears what looked like two giant palms carved out of rock. Shamanic legend insists that shamans will live as long as these ten fingers are there. The legendary female shaman, Yen Jima, is buried on the opposite side of the slope. The grave of Zarin Bo, a great shaman who went through all nine stages of the initiation procedure, is found nearby. They say that in the old days, such shamans merged with a spirit during a ritual to control the weather, travel over long distances, or even levitate by hovering over the birch trees. After a ceremony, Bayer and two aides go to the base of the giant palms. Weaker and less experienced shamans are barred from here, and with good reason, this area's spirit is too powerful. At long last, the Chelyabinsk shaman, Turgen Kham, has reached the sacred glade. Here, in the thick of a forest, he has built a set of ritual installations with his own hands. In summertime, the season packed with shamanic rituals, Turgen stays in a tent just outside the glade for weeks on end. The spirits receive food in this special place. Here, we light a bonfire made of a certain number of branches. For example, seven layers of branches symbolize a lower world. A ritual to exercise the souls of sick people requires seven such layers. The sick person uses a spoon to offer the spirits whatever is in the bowl he holds in his hands as the shaman sings to invoke them. When there is milk in the bowl, the sick person's thoughts are focused on what he could get in return. He might ask the spirits to get rid of his ailments, give him luck, or wish him a good journey. Shamans regard the place where bonfires are lit as sacred. Turgen comes here each year before the onset of winter to clean it up and remove the ashes left over from the summertime rituals. After the cleansing procedure, Turgen spreads a mixture of rice and beads across the clean spot. In this way, the shaman asks the earth and local spirits to forgive him for the inconvenience. 
Before he is about to leave the forest, Chirgen collects fir tree branches and carefully covers the Ongon with them. The Ongon is an image of the Taiga's ruler carved out of a pine trunk. The symbol of a spirit is supposed to guard the glade against intruders. We see to it that he keeps warm in winter. We don't want him to freeze, we want him to stand on guard. He never sleeps unlike other spirits. They rise to the sky to live there until the arrival of spring. Modern day scientists have not given up their quest to understand what happens to shamans when they are in contact with the spirits. They want to know whether shamanism is not some sort of myth created by a group of mentally imbalanced people. Research was done several years ago at both the Institute of Neurophysiology and Higher Nervous Activity and the Institute for Ethnology and Anthropology at the Russian Academy of Sciences. Initially, so-called neo-shamans and urban shamans were involved in those special experiments. Neo-shamans represented a new generation of shamanic tradition. Here is a demonstration of an experiment in the presence of a large audience. These experts studying shamanism represent a number of countries. For a start, instruments are attached to the body of a neo-shaman. They will record the state of his blood vessels. This somewhat odd device on his head is a special cap designed by one of our offices. A shaman's creative act is an act of affectation. That is to say, he needs to work himself up into a state of ecstasy. After that, all processes inside his brain slow down, especially those connected with speech. Then the brain begins functioning in a fashion which is not characteristic of its normal activity. In other words, the man activates the brain's right hemisphere particularly its frontal lobes, which are responsible for his creative thinking. Shamans put themselves in a state where they see a pattern of personages. They map out a program allowing the existence of such personages, model them and picture them in their mind's eye. It might be said that later the personages overpower the shamans. Shamans say, however, the key thing is not to allow the personages to gain the upper hand on them. Churgan Kam, the shaman in Chelyabinsk, is in for a hectic day. He will travel 500 kilometers from Chelyabinsk to Arkaim, the site of the ruins of a legendary town across the boundary separating Europe from Asia, to perform a shamanic ritual near the site of an ancient settlement. In recent years, Arkaim has become popular with followers of all esoteric schools. They believe that this is the site of the world's largest geological rupture. Some are even confident the mountain where Turgen is going to perform the ritual is actually a volcano that erupted millions of years ago. But Turgen takes a skeptical view of those theories. He is more interested in the energy generated at the juncture of Europe and Asia. He will try to evoke the local spirits here. His hope is that they will help resolve a problem affecting a sick man. The ritual follows a standard scenario. The shaman gradually enters a trance. The tambourine's rhythmic tempo quickens, and the shaman's movements become ever more abrupt and jerky. The tambourine falls silent. The shaman writhes with convulsions. This means that a spirit has entered him. As a rule, the shaman knows which spirit he is invoking and what he can expect of it. This time, however, something has gone wrong. Blood begins trickling from the shaman's mouth. His sagging legs hardly support him as he limps around the bonfire, producing incomprehensible sounds or roaring like a beast. Somebody has fainted. Everybody becomes jittery. No contact with the spirit is likely to take place today. The tension dies down a few minutes later when a spirit in the shape of a shaman accepts a gift and begins gesturing as he squats near the sick man. Soon he roars again and vanishes in the dark.
Soon Tia Gen is found lying face down in the snow. He has absolutely no idea of what happened to him only a short while ago. Even so, the ritual has to go on. A spade with a handful of red-hot coals taken from the bonfire is moved close to the shaman's face. As the sick man looks on, the shaman grabs the coals, shoves them into his mouth and chews them and spits them out into the snow. How many ailments have been defeated in today's ritual depends on the number of coals chewed by the shaman. Shortly before dawn, Turgen manages to overcome his lethargy to go to Mount Shamanka to thank the local spirits and pray to the sun, Mother Earth, and above all else, the eternal blue sky. This is how Buryat epic literature describes it. The eternal blue sky is without beginning or end. It moves without the support of limbs. It brings peace, welfare, and happiness to the land below. It prevents war and disease and tames fire and floods. It is the lord of earth and water, multiplying all that exists.